I would like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Sometimes I forget to do that. And then at the end of the episode, I'm just like, oh, yeah, by the way, their name is this. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess quick introduction. Um, Michael McReynolds. I go by Sweater Disco. Um, I do a lot of different things. So <laughs> uh, to break it down, I DJ a lot. Uh, I produce house music, club music generally. Uh, do a lot of edits and remixing. Um, I am like essentially a full-time freelancer, mixing and mastering engineer, producer. Uh, I'm an Ableton instructor in Indianapolis at this little school called Decademics, which teaches Ableton production and like turntablism DJing, basically. Um, beyond that, I was a live sound engineer for Old National Center, a Live Nation venue up until the pandemic. So uh, I've got my <laughs> many hats that I've worn, basically. Um, primarily focusing right now, of course, on DJing production uh, and just kind of figuring out what I want to do as an artist. For sure. Dude, that's uh, uh, a jack of all trades. That's what I'm mm -hmm. hearing. <laughs> also, that's what it looks like on your profile. Like you go to your website, it's just there's so many different things. It's just like yeah. audio. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Hell yeah, that's awesome, man. You know, we both have some pretty long, curly hair. That's true. And uh, <laughs> I was wondering, do you do anything? Is there any like special preparation for this? I mean, damn, it's like, I, yeah, got, a lot, I got a lot going on. Um, honestly, everyone always asks me that. I don't do much. I, you know, condition when I, sure. when I can every couple of days, uh, probably wash it like twice a week. You got to keep it natural, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had this, I mean, I've been growing it out since probably like, damn, like seventh grade. It's been so long since I've had short hair. Like I, I remember I just kind of decided to grow it out probably right around when I was like starting to like play guitar and shit. Cause I'm like, oh, this is going to mm. be, this is going to be really cool. I'm going to like play guitar, have the hair. Uh, and people like didn't recognize me when I got back to school and they were like, oh shit, your hair got like way longer. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the punk I, uh, <laughs> I You've had it for way longer. I'm kind of a newbie. For a long time, I was like, yeah, I don't really know how to deal with all of this hair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> but now it's been like four or five years and I feel like if I, if I went back to short, I would just be like... I'd feel very lost. It's like a security blanket. I just got my hat and my hair and I'm like, it's my little, my weighted blanket that comes with me everywhere. <laughs> yeah, man. All right, cool. Glad we got the hair talk out of the way. There was something that was like really um, essential on my list of things to cover. So yeah, that's that. very fair. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I like to also open up with a... Uh, Kind of icebreaker question. I feel like the hair was kind of more icebreakery, but I always like to ask, what was your first concert? Oh man. Um, so first concert of my life was Hillary Duff, surprisingly oh, enough. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. And it was funny, me and my girlfriend recently were talking about that, and we both both of our first concerts were Hillary Duff. At no different way. locations, but we're like, damn, like that's, that's kind of nuts. That's just a shared experience, I guess. Um, but I was really in, I thought she was like the hottest lady ever when I was like a kid. And so I was like, yeah, I want to go see Hillary Duff in concert. I don't really remember much about the concert. I was like mad young. Um, then, I mean, I've always played music, so I just ended up going to more shows as I got older. So like, my first like big like outdoor type concert with like general admission, whatever, like was like Disturbed and Shine Down and like Hailstorm and a bunch of like metal bands that were playing out in Indianapolis at like a big like summer kind of festival daytime show. Um, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. That was cool. That was a good experience. And then the first like real like, whoa, my mind just exploded type show was uh, Skrillex, 12th Planet, and Alvin Risk at oh, Egyptian Room in, in Indianapolis. Yeah, and just sound like, like lasers. <laughs> yeah, and so I was 15. Um, it's at this big, like indoor, like ballroom style venue. 
in Indianapolis, um, probably like 2000 cap or so. Um, right before Bangarang, I want to came out, I want to say. Um, and so like, I had heard about Skrillex from some of my friends who were into music as well, but like growing up on like the north side of Indianapolis, there wasn't really any electronic stuff going on. And I'm talking, this was like 2011, like 2010, 2011. Um, mm. I was like, I've never seen this stuff. Like, I don't even know what is being done on stage. Like, I don't know anything about DJing at this point. I just yeah. like, I like Skrillex. Literally, I was reading like the paper and saw that Skrillex was coming in like November of like 2011 or something. Uh, and I was like, hey, uh, Mia, like my older sister, let's like go to this show. I feel like it's going to be cool. Like, it's just, um, and literally had no idea what to expect. My mom drove us downtown. So like an hour from where we lived up in Noblesville um, in our minivan. She like dropped us off at the concert and all these people are coming in with like raver boots and like these crazy fits on. And my mom's just like, what the hell uh, did we get into out here? <laughs> like, um, so she just like, let, we went to the concert and my mom just like waited at a Starbucks or something. Uh, and yeah, that was like game over for me. I was like, this is like the most exciting shit I've ever like been a part of basically. Yeah. Um, I just remember like, it was really like a nice, t like special time because everyone in the crowd was so, you had to know what was going on to like even be at the show at that year, you know? Um, sure. and I just remember like hearing like reptile and scary monsters and like Equinox and everyone's just like doing like at that point pre moshing, it was like the dubstep, like hand wave where everyone's just like, pfft. Oh, uh -huh. and I'm just like vibing out. Like I was like, shit, I got to go home and pirate Ableton uh, immediately. Uh, <laughs> started making music like and just trying to piece together how to DJ like right after that, essentially, because I wow. was like, I want to I want to figure out what is going on with all this stuff, basically. <laughs> yeah, dude, for sure. I mean, I've heard Skrillex describe his concerts as like the most energy you've ever <laughs> seen. And I've been to Skrill shows, met like I don't know how many times, but yeah, he's sick, and that it's just I, I don't know. I feel like that is an amazing way. I was gonna ask you about like origin stories, but that is just how we kind of got. Yeah, there. <laughs> and then I, I mean, would say the other half of that would be like, I mean, my mom and dad grew up showing me a lot of music, and they both grew up, you know, we're listening to a lot of music in like the late seventies, eighties type of stuff so my mom was listening to like Depeche Mode Nine Inch Nails like For sure. nice. so I got into that stuff absurdly early like pro I was probably listening to Nine Inch Nails in like 6th or 7th grade <laughs> and I was just like the angsty kid who's like playing guitar listening to stuff like that but it's just kind of the natural progression to get into the more electronic stuff from that because it has its roots so heavily in like synthesizers and stuff yeah. like that um, mm -hmm. so she actually got me my first dead mouse CD as well, which was four times four equals 12. And oh. I didn't know anything about dead yeah. mouse at the time, but my mom just follows like charts and like, she still does on like books and new books and, and CDs and whatnot. But she like picked up this CD and I didn't get it at first. I was like, oh, I mean, this is like, it's cool, but it wasn't like my favorite shit ever. Um, but then just over time, I was like, oh yeah, like all of Dead Mouse's like back catalog was really sick and everything like since then has been dope. Um, but I think that helped a lot just to show me some more electronic stuff. Wow. That's so dope that your mom like was, <laughs> yeah. I feel like most people I talk to, they're like, yeah, my parents, they just don't understand. Like, what <laughs> it's just like your mom's being supportive. Yeah. I, I, my parents are very, very supportive, which is really, it's really helpful because I mean, I don't know how else I would have been able to kind of freelance and and do my thing without having support of some sort, honestly. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm very happy about that. And they'll even, they'll come out to shows. Like, they came in to my first shows in Indianapolis. And like, when I've opened for uh, bigger DJs who are coming through, they're always trying to come out and see stuff. So it's, that's, that's a lot of fun. It's just kind of nice. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Twelfth Planet. I mean, that is a yeah. crazy lineup. First of all, Alvin Risk, yeah. <laughs> Twelfth Planet, Skrillex, like insane. It was really so sick. Much sense. But I was gonna ask, 
this is a bad transition, but 12 Planet, I also know about Home Planet, <laughs> and I wanted to ask how that started. And, oh uh, and maybe you can just explain what that is a little bit. Absolutely. So this is, this goes, there's so much content to unpack with, with this, I would say. But essentially, um, so we started that show. I'm, you know, 15, 2011. I start making music. I go through high school, writing music, putting out mixtapes, whatever. Um, I get to my senior year. I'm like, maybe I want to pursue this through college. You know, maybe I want to go to be an engineer, um, which I didn't really think of until my senior year. I honestly thought I was going to go to school to be a music teacher. I was going to play classical piano or jazz guitar. Those were like the things that I was like pretty sure about for a lot of my life up until that point. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, you know what? Like I can still play all the music stuff, but I, I want to do something that has more possibilities, I would say. Um, and just engineering, there's so much you can do with it. Like your day to day is always something new. So I decided to kind of pivot to focus more on that. Um, so I basically applied to, you know, a couple schools around Indiana for music, got into, um, you know, Ball State and DePaul and the Jacobs School of Music for engineering. Um, was very surprised when I got the letter from Jacobs because I went into that interview with these like classical engineers, like interviewing the hell out of me. And I was like, dude, I walked out. I was like, I am so screwed. There's no way that they're like this kid who's like messing around in Ableton, making this like electronic electro whatever like would work for this program. But, you know, luckily they saw like just, I guess I'm willing to try a lot of different things. And so I ended up getting in and that was like so, such a turning point for me because of the people I met in that program primarily and just the experiences I was able to have in Bloomington. Um, so I, I get into school. Um, I pretty much immediately meet like all, I had 13 other people who got into the program who were like my closest friends, essentially. Um, and there was like four or five that did a lot of electronic stuff or more production. And we all make, made our own stuff, you know, still make our own music. Um, and we were a little frustrated by the types of parties we were going to because we're like, this is a lot of boring, like either top 40 or DJs who wanted to play cool stuff who felt hindered by like the crowd, essentially. For sure. Um, For sure. And we're like, damn, this like kind of blows because we want to like, you know, let people play their own stuff. Like we want to create a kind of scene for production and DJing that's like really pushing what we think is cool, essentially. Um, and my friend Erica Wood, who goes by Lunamatic, um, like they had this name, Home Planet, from a label they started in like earlier high school and we really liked the name. Me and Erica and Nick King, who were, you know, the three people who started Home Planet. And we started with just very rudimentary, like shitty graphic design. And we knew a lot of people who threw basement shows in Bloomington for like indie rock and whatever, but we really hadn't seen much in terms of like electronic music or DJing at all, like ever. <laughs> um, so we basically went out on a limb and we're like, let's throw a party. We're going to play it. We're going to just put on some people who we think are doing cool stuff and essentially just send it and see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> we got our sound system together. Uh, our lineup for the first party, which would have been in 2015, I want to say. Um, it was like Prism, this duo from, from Bloomington that headlined. And uh, I played as well as Excited Nonetheless, Lunamatic. And then the guy who let us like host it at his house. Uh, Jimbo, he went by, uh, who played like footwork stuff. He played as well. Um, pretty much 9 p.m. rolls around and we're like, holy shit, this is going to flop. This is going to go horribly. Like there's no way that people are going to show up to this. Um, but sure enough, like we get like an hour and a half into the night and we're like, oh shit, like there's like a lot of people showing up 
People are very into the music. People are supportive of the DJs. They're being respectful. Um, and it's like at that point, a lot of us were playing, like I, I was doing more of a DJ set, but some of the other acts were doing primarily all original sets. And that, seeing that go off was like, oh shit, people are here to just like see what's out there, essentially. And that's, that was super fun. I just remember playing like, Records that I was really into, like Kill Frenzy stuff and Justin Martin and like house stuff that wasn't really getting airtime at that point in college towns very much. Um, and people were like digging it super hard. I'm like, oh shit, we have like something really cool going on here. So we continued oh, yeah. those parties like through 2018. Along the way, uh, I met, well, we all just met so many of our friends, like people who are my best friends. We talk to like every day. <laughs> um, like I met CLB, uh, Max that way, oh, along yeah. with the rest of the Ionic Collective guys like uh, sure. uh, Kai and Waxcraft and, you know, oh, yeah. everybody else like Jake Doan. Because um, <laughs> Jake went to IU at the time as well. So that's, that's how I knew him. Um, uh -huh. And just so many people like our, our sound guy who ended up kind of renting out his club sound system to us for our later parties um, was one of our best friends kind of throughout that whole process. Uh, and he played like deep dubstep drum and bass type stuff. And then we met um, like, do, if you know, like Solus presents like Wiley and um, like Uju and mm -hmm. Rince or those guys are kind of living in the Indianapolis area now. But like sure. I met a lot of those guys through their own parties and just being in Bloomington. Um, so it was really a kind of special time for Bloomington as a whole because we started to see like a real like uptick in the DJ scene and the producer scene uh, around that time which was you know exciting that we were able to kind of be a part of that and then mm -hmm. on the more national level we were able to bring in like Jay Kutch and Zavi and for sure uh, like Cam Cam Stacy <laughs> of yeah, course yeah, yeah, like yeah. I mean and that was just people who we met only solely because we were throwing shows and just wanted to bring in people from out of town who we thought were doing cool stuff. Um, so yeah, and then I've just continued Home Planet in Indianapolis as a now monthly party at a little dive bar called the Melody Inn. Um, oh, cool. Where, uh, hey, fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I just, I recently, we actually just had our six month show on Tuesday, like two days ago. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. I, I've pretty much been handling that because I'm pretty much the only one in the crew who's living in Indianapolis right now. Um, so I've been hosting that and playing a set and then also bringing on like two guest DJs of literally like any genre, as long as they're doing something cool, um, just yeah. like each month. Um, like this time we had like a drum and bass DJ, Haji Mari, and like a Jersey club DJ, um, Navi, who are both from Indianapolis. And it was like, I love just making these weird pair ups of genre and it like usually works which is really fun um but yeah i've been doing that and then home planet is kind of just our own little label as well because we have distribution for like you know spotify beatport whatever where i've self-released stuff through there we've had lunamatic on there um done like a remix ep for a track that i did with the round two guys a couple of years back um yeah just a lot of fun and it's like i've always loved the whole visual kind of aspect of home planet because we lucked out with the graphic design and it's just something that a lot of people like um but yeah i'm just running with it seeing what happens uh it's just a fun thing to have on the side
I'm curious what you think of the the DJ like equipment as an instrument because obviously there's levels to it. You know what I mean? You're just like depending on what you're doing, it can be more and more difficult and you know if yeah. you have four tracks going, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sound good, but to pull it off and do it well, that can be really cool. Yeah. Um so what do I think about what do I think about the DJ? Like is it an as instrument like an equi- as an instrument? Is it an um, instrument? Yes. <laughs> yeah. A thousand percent, yeah. Um I I feel right now like I have the same relationship with a rack of CDJs and a mixer as I did with piano, as I do with as I still do with with instruments. Sometimes even more so. Like sometimes I'll go back to the piano and have to like reacquaint myself a little bit. But I almost have muscle memory of like CDJs in a mixer at this point. Like, and I know how the signal flows. I know how the signal flow runs of the effects, whether that's on like certain channels or on just like the the master effects. Um, I feel like every time I play a set, I learn something new and I try to learn something new about, you know, how to mix, how to do a more interesting transition. Um, And I think like, yeah, it's very accessible where like a lot of people can learn the basics and understand how to do it, which is great. Like, I think that's so fun that people can learn how to DJ without like spending years trying to learn how to do it, essentially. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Because really, like if you have any sort of taste of music, like you can have fun as a DJ. You can even be a good DJ yeah. if you have like solid taste in music and no technical skills. Yeah. Essentially. No, I um, I, uh, I taught my girlfriend like, what, you know, if you got like two YouTube videos going and you want to <laughs> transition and you just like turn on the volume of one and you kind of turn it up. So now she's like, I'm a DJ. And she has, honestly, <laughs> she has really good uh, taste in music. So it's like, that's, that's like 90% of it. I mean, you can get yeah. really technical, but if you're playing good music, I don't think people are really going to care about the technicality. Yeah. I, I remember even when, like, a few years after I had started doing stuff in Bloomington, and there were a couple DJs who were just starting, who are now, like, fantastic DJs in Indianapolis, um, but they were starting on, like, virtual DJ and stuff. And people were like, oh, like, that's whack, whatever, because it's virtual DJ. I'm like, yo... Like, these DJs playing on virtual DJs, like, they have way better taste than you. Like, legit. Like, and it's, that's not the important thing. The important thing is the, the playing the good music. I literally, if the music's good enough, I don't care if the transitions are kind of whack. Like, the music speaks for itself for the most part. Um, of course, the technical side is important. Like, yeah. the better you are at the technical stuff, the more... I guess the more seamlessly you can represent like yourself as a DJ and with less kind of hiccups in between songs is good. Like that's good for you as a DJ to be able to do. Um, But also if you're playing really wild records and it's just hard to like beat match, like whatever, it's fun to hear the mix happen. It's fun to hear like the little screw ups. Like that's what makes it a live performance, you know? For sure. Um, For sure. And that's like when I'm juggling, you know, three decks, four decks, and I've got stuff going. That's my mind trying to push myself even harder than I've I've gone before. Yeah. Um, and you just learn more. You, like if you're always pushing and learning more about the performance, about the gear, about how the gear works, you're gonna come out the other side like a good DJ, essentially. Um, so. Yeah, it's an instrument. I mean, <laughs> okay, okay, it's an instrument. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've heard it here first. Um, decademics. How did you? Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't really have to talk about like how you got involved, but I'm curious what you do <laughs> there. Do you do? Um, is it mostly CDJs? Is it like actual turn? To, do you do scratching? I've always wanted to do scratching, but I've always wanted to do it on like real vinyl. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so basically. The people who run Decademics are like legendary DJs in Indianapolis. Like DJ Metronome and DJ Top Speed. And I'm sure there's others that I'm forgetting. Uh, but those are the two people who I like associate most with Decademics are like nutty, long-standing hip-hop DJs, turntablists. 
And they started the school primarily for teaching turntable DJ. Like for sure. Um, and be, I agree with that. I think that if you can teach someone on turntables, they will have no problem going to CDJ. Obviously. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, you can um, see where all the kicks are. Like, you know, that's, yeah, that's easy. It's like, if you can do, if you can, you know, play vinyl, you can play whatever. Like that's, that's cool. Um, they also have CDJs, which I've taught lessons on every once in a while. If people come in and ask for specifically like some CDJ pointers, um, because that's the thing that I know inside and out. Um, but what I do there is Ableton teaching. Um, oh, cool. Pretty much like number one far and away. Like it's only a handful of times where I've taught like CDJ stuff. Um, but what I do on my like week to week basis is I teach. Ableton, just how to use it, how to get around the program, how to remix, sample, make sounds, do sound design, use effects, mix, master, uh, pretty much anything uh, from a level like zero knowledge to, you know, however far you are along in learning Ableton. Um, I've been doing that since 2020. And it has really advanced my understanding of Ableton oh, I as bet. a program, obviously, yeah. because like it's one thing for me to just do my thing and be like, oh, yeah, it works like this. But if you have to explain that to someone who's never seen an audio workstation, um, that's like most people would fall apart. And yeah. I did at first. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, how do I even explain like, how do you explain sample rate? How do you explain bit depth? Yeah. I'm like, oh, God, like. What even is this man? <laughs> like um, Or like dithering so, pops up and you're just like Yeah. And they're like, What's and like, what's dithering? Uh, you're like, um, well, they add noise to the like, signal and you're like, bro, I don't know. That's like some yeah. intense technical <laughs> stuff. So yeah, I, I teach like that. Uh some mu basic music theory stuff along with that. Um but yeah, I'm really glad to be able to do that. And it's people who are sometimes very young. Like I'm teaching a kid now who's like, I think he's like 11 or 12, um, how to use Ableton, which is insane to amazing, me. Like, amazing. And I know if I was 11 or 12, like when I was that age, there was nothing out there. Like there was pretty much nothing out there for me to learn from, yeah. essentially. Um, so it's really sick to go from me when I was 15, literally fumbling my way through Ableton with no guide yeah. to like now there's literally a place where people can go and learn Ableton from people who have been using it for a long time, you know? Um, yeah. And I like to think I'm a good teacher, hopefully, but well, you said <laughs> that you were almost destined to be a teacher. At least that's what you thought. Was that because of your, your music theory and like, uh, you know, piano background and, like, it's like, oh, what do you do next? Teach people how to do that. Yeah, that thing. Okay, exactly. Gotcha. And like, I just kind of was like, I mean, when I think about like my experience learning piano, I was like, I mean, I was competing in like piano competitions, like throughout high school, nice. applying for like performance stuff where I had to, they were like, oh, you need to learn like a Bach prelude and a Chopin piece and Tchaikovsky and like whatever else. So you had to come in with a repertoire, play it in front of like the, the, the faculty. Yeah. And like, I was like, damn, this is like really intense, you know, <laughs> like, um, and there was a lot of stress associated with that. So I didn't necessarily want to be a performer mm -hmm. like of piano for sure. Because like, that's like, I would go crazy, man. Uh, <laughs> And so I thought teaching would be kind of the next best thing, I guess, no, or not even next best thing, but just like another thing I could do. Like a logical, yeah. Yeah. Like there's two paths. Um, yeah. And so then just having come the long way around to teaching this now, um, I think it's the right time for me to be teaching it because up until now, I don't know if I would have the understanding myself to really explain things as well as I can. Um, and it just also feels like I'm doing more than just going out and playing music, playing MP3s and getting paid, <laughs> essentially, like, which is fun. But I love that I'm able to kind of help out people who are learning as well. Yeah, I mean, 
that feels like it would be just intrinsically more rewarding because you're connecting with someone you're like seeing that light bulb go off in their head i mean it can it can get kind of lonely just throwing out hey i'm doing this hey i'm doing this look (laughs) at this that i'm doing it's like of course you have to promote yourself but it's it feels kind of narcissistic in a way but you have to do it you know yeah (laughs) so um but yeah i like that teaching doesn't involve any of that stuff Mm kind of um it's really just all about like really if you break it down i want who i'm teaching to to feel like they are learning something that is fun and that is rewarding and kind of like doing some sort of magic trick on a computer (laughs) because that's kind of what it can be like sometimes yeah um and i love being able to show people something um and they're like whoa like it just like clicks and they get really excited about it. And they're like, oh, so that's how you do that thing that I heard in that one record that I really like, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, like, it's, it's not some mystical thing that's way out there like a lot of people think it is, you know? Like, it's very accessible if you understand the software, if you understand, like, where to go to ask for help. I'm like, how do I do this thing? Like, I am there to try to explain that. To you and I love it when people come in with questions. I love it when they listen to something and bring it in, and they say, "Oh, I, I was hearing this technique, or I heard this artist doing something that I really liked." And then I can break it down, essentially make it more accessible for them. And that's like a really cool thing to be able to do. That I would be super happy to have had when I was fifteen. Oh, so I'm yeah. just glad that I can do it now well, for people who are even younger. And <laughs> it's just like a new way of continuing to learn. Do like if someone comes to you and they're like, "Oh, I want to learn how to do this like Skrillex screech," and you're like, "Yeah, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know exactly, but like, let's look at it. Oh, it's probably <laughs> using this synthesizer, like FM eight or something. Use a lot of that, or you know, yeah. whatever. You like guess, and then you go in there and try to figure it out. It's like you got to kind of reverse engineer stuff, which would be like a fun yeah. little game to do. Honestly, it's like, so yeah, that that is cool. That is. I feel like very helpful. It's not just for the student. It's also for you. Yeah. Like I learn a lot. And then kind of along those lines, I have had like more experienced producers come to me and that's where shit gets real complicated. Oh yeah. (laughs) Cause like, you know, it's people saying, can you explain FM synthesis to me? And I'm like, oh boy. Like, (laughs) yes. Yeah. I, I think, (laughs) I think I know. Um, Yeah. But it actually, then I'm forced to sit down for an hour or two, learn more about it, understand exactly what to reach for in operator or FM8, um, stuff like that. And then I've had people say like, oh, how do I do that techno kick drum rumble thing? And I'm like, there's Uh another technique I can go learn from a, a YouTube video. And so I'm just taking these little bits and pieces of things, teaching them. And then also I gain something as well because it's a technique that I've never used before exactly. Um, yeah. So it's a big it's a big waterfall For sure. of learning. That's basically. awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It's good to have a bunch of things like that in your life that you know continue to make you to grow. Um, I wanted to ask you about something I saw on your website, and that was that yeah. Prism, a group that you were talking about before, <laughs> released a track called Where We Started, and then that ended up on the Forza 5 soundtrack. And like, yes. <laughs> I, I saw that, I was like, that's pretty fucking cool, man. Like, <laughs> Thank you, man. And you, you, <clears throat> um, you mixed and mastered or mixed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mixed and mastered. Nice. Um, that was so exciting for me. Like, I... So yeah, um, I basically met Emma and Nick in Prism when. So the first week I got to IU in Bloomington, they were out DJing in front of the art museum in Bloomington with another guy who ended up becoming my roommate and one of my best friends. Uh, but I met all of them and was like, okay, so here's where the electronic music is. Um, they went on to do a lot of really, really cool stuff, like playing at Red Rocks with Marshmallow. Wow. And like... Yeah, some some really crazy stuff and are still working on a lot of music. We're actually working on some stuff uh, currently. I'm not sure when, like what the timeline is on that, but it's, you know, sounding good. 
But I worked on Where We Started and Release, I think it was, on that EP that they put out, which was around 2018 or 2019, I want to say. Um, so yeah, song wrapped up, uh, mixed and mastered, sent off. Uh, it did well. Like it did really, really well. I think that was the first thing I've worked on that's gotten over like a million streams, which was really exciting. Wow. Um, and then like, so they approached me, they were like, Hey, we think this is getting picked up by, you know, Microsoft for Forza. Uh, so I basically sent off like, you know, uh, the instrumental and like, I don't know if it was like a pre-master or I think it was really just instrumentals that they needed along with the final masters. Mm. Um, didn't hear f about that deal for another like, 12 months like wow. <laughs> because like I mean the the game development cycle is so long like right um so from pretty much inception of that deal to when the game released was 18 months where I couldn't say shit about it <laughs> and I was like oh god like I really hope this doesn't fall through yeah. because this opportunity is like really sick um so finally the Forza 5 like soundtrack premieres are coming out and it's on there with like Porter Robinson and these like number one pop artists and like Dua Lipa. And I'm like, there we go. Like, yeah. that's the credit that I needed like yeah. <laughs> to put on the top of my portfolio, Hell whatever. Yeah. Um, super excited. So that is a collab with another guy from Indie, Mass Appeal. Um, and so basically it was like over the pandemic where we like got together in the studio for like, it was like a day or two. And really he just had this idea to like work on some like 140 breaks type stuff. And so basically I ran with that idea, found that acapella. So we were like set on that. And then a lot of it like, so we came up with the main idea probably in like a day or so, which was like that lead, like main melody, like the general kind of outline with the vocals. But then it kind of sat on my hard drive for probably like two years. Uh -huh. Like, cause that was like early 2020. Um, he like came back and asked me about it. And honestly, I was like, you know what? Like I'm working on other stuff. Like, I don't know what's going to come of this exactly, but I like spent some time and like found it again. And I was like, damn it, this is actually like pretty sick. <laughs> like, um, and the cool thing was that I could tell that I've gotten so much better at mixing because right off the bat, I was like, damn, this sounds like shit. <laughs> Basically, like, so I immediately kind of spruced it up, fattened it up, um, reworked some of the production, added some bass parts, added some synth parts, and just like generally like did a lot of mixing on it like it just needed some some shaping uh in certain areas um and it ended up really sick and i was like you know this record's really weird and so i don't know what to do with it exactly 
but he kind of came back to me like a few days later and was like, hey, Morelia, who's like a house and footwork and juke artist, uh, wants to put it out on, on Teethy Records, which is where it ended up. Mm. Um, and so I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like considering this is a record I had nearly no intentions of doing much with when I, when I first started it. Like I am just happy to be putting out something that's like not a house record. Because it's really the first thing I've done in a very long time that's not like house, tech house, bass house in that kind of area. Mm. Um, even though it's still got like a lot of my quirks that I usually put in things, like the weird noises and weird synth so like solos and right. whatever else. Um, so yeah, we rolled that out. That came out um, last month, like early last month um, on this compilation with like eight or nine other tracks. Um, and it was super cool just to be on, on something that's a little more on the underground side, like more on the electro breaks footwork kind of tip, which is cool. Cause I would love to be able to play more of that stuff in my sets. So this gives me a great reason to do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure, dude. I mean, you got to just explore whatever you're into at the time. And if this opens up that door, too, yeah. sometimes you make something and you're just like, I don't even know. This is pretty cool. Maybe I could do this more. But then I'm always thinking like, you ever think about going under a different moniker for the, the purpose <laughs> of creating a different genre? Uh, yeah, I, I've considered it. But I, I think that like, for me anyway, like I don't have much of a like, brand i would say like for me my brand is just it's it's me it's like you. people literally think my name is sweater disco like <laughs> <laughs> yeah essentially i called like, you on people, the phone the other day i was like uh sweater yeah, yeah. Disco? Like, <laughs> yeah it's like i i know people for years sometimes and they're like what is your real name and i'm like wow uh <laughs> like uh but it's it's kind of cool that like i mean it's just who, what my personality is, I guess. It's just like it fits. Um, and so I like to think that Sweater Disco is just whatever I want it to be, essentially. Like it can be weird bass music even. If I wanted to put out like a bass record, I would just put it out. It can be, it can be experimental synth stuff, which I've done. It can be like a punk record, like which I put two out <laughs> of, like which is weird. And I don't know if anyone even like listens to it, but I just like don't care. Like I want to put stuff out that I love and that I, if I make something that I love, I will just put it out under my name without really thinking like, oh, how, how is this going to affect my brand? You know, like what, <laughs> what is this going to do for me? Like, I don't think people really care. Like, I think they want to hear all sides of an artist, essentially. Like if people don't want to hear that, then they can listen to whatever else they listen to yeah you know you can listen to a um, playlist of the music yeah. genre that you like, want <laughs> hear yeah um i i just think it's fun to experiment and it's fun to like i want to show other artists in doing that that like you can go outside of your box you can like do something that's just fun and that's silly like you could even make dumb shit that's fun and put it out and like i don't know unless you're like tiesto nobody's really gonna care <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> Basically, yeah. like he's pretty set I mean, in his ways. Yeah, it's like you don't have to take like your whole brand like so seriously. Like it's good, it's good to take yourself seriously and know what you're going for. Um, because that helps people like fit into, you know, the dance music scene on the larger side of things, you know? Sure. Um, but like there's so much room for experimentation that I think like especially now. People like they want to see some different stuff. You know, it's not it's not big room house anymore. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> it's you can do whatever you want, and we want to see some innovation, basically, and like multi genre DJ sets and multi genre DJ nights. Yeah. Um, and if I'm gonna say like, oh, I'm booking like a multi genre DJ night, whatever. Like, I want to make that stuff too. I wanna I want to practice what I preach, basically. Um, and so, yeah, it's just about having fun, playing stuff that's cool, and having a nice old time. Yeah, that's and about like, it. <laughs> like, I feel like trying to be professional or like, you know, push yourself again. Try to be professional, yeah. you know, push yourself, experiment, learn some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people doing that now, and it's, it's great. Like, when I think of people who are like, 
very experimental and push themselves while still being very professional. I think of like, you know, Justin J is a great example. Like he makes a lot of stuff that's very silly. That's, but he's broken out of like where he started with like house stuff and is now doing like electro rave music, like whatever else. I think like Anna Morgan with um, Worst Behavior Records is doing a lot of really cool stuff. Like, Everyone who we know in Chicago is doing like the craziest shit imaginable. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Like, I feel like every I mean So I've been doing this show for like I don't even know how long it is, but maybe three, four years. But I took a break for a while. And now that I'm back doing weekly releases, like a lot of people that I interviewed previously, you know, they're not the same person. Like they're not the same yeah. person and they don't even have the same name. They're not producing the same genre. And it's like it's good. Like I would be a little bit concerned if you were like same level of, I don't know, <laughs> not that it has to be success oriented, but if you were just like in the same place, listening to the same music, I'd be like, damn, you really love that specific type of music. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, you gotta, you gotta let yourself change, you know, like yeah. nobody, nobody stays the same and there's no reason why your career has to, you know, stagnate because you're afraid of trying something new for fear of like, you know, upsetting whoever, you know, mm -hmm. like at the end of the day, if you're able to just keep going and keep creating and keep finding something new to get excited about, I think that's a win and other people will probably get excited too, you know, for sure. For sure. And that's, that's something to keep in mind for sure. Um, I feel like yeah. I feel like this episode is like your teacher's coming out a little bit. You know, we want to like yeah. we want to guide people <laughs> in the right direction. And I actually yeah. I I'll have to put this back at an earlier part when we were talking about mixing, but I remembered what I was going to say and that was um, you know, for people who are you know, like you get into this type of music and there's so many avenues and you don't even really realize that you could be a mixer, master, you could do live sound. I mean, you do it all. So it's like you've <laughs> gone through it all. And for someone yeah. who's trying to get into like mixing and mastering, I'm just kind of curious, like what would be a little piece of advice to to bestow upon them? Like you're just <laughs> getting into it. You're mixing your friend's song. Like, yeah, just practice, like um, use reference tracks. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think any advice that I give is okay. So. I've actually had someone or a couple of people have asked me this just throughout the last few years. Like, how do I, how do I like live as a freelancer? Yeah. Essentially. Like, how do you make rent? I, like I've only recently made rent off of freelancing. It's fucking hard. Congrats, like, man. That's dope. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but like people were asking me for advice, like looking for like a magic answer of like, here's the one thing you have to do to, to make it, to, to make a million dollars and whatever and retire and whatever else. Um, <laughs> yeah. But to be real, it's like it takes years. Like it took me up until literally December to move out of my parents' house because I was, I was like not consistent enough with work and just building up that portfolio and whatever else. I would say, okay, so step one is... You're going to have to do stuff for very cheap. Yeah. And as a side thing, if you, if you have to have a job, have a job. Um, do the thing as a side thing and do it for cheap and do it for as many people as comfortably possible, pretty much. Um, because you're going to really up your skills. You'll learn what people expect and you will build your portfolio, which is very, you know, good. Mm -hmm. to be doing of course like without a portfolio people don't trust you yeah basically like people have to see that you've worked on you know at least a few things that sound okay <laughs> for them to take a chance on you um and learn as much about what you're doing as possible like read books look up who the best people are in your field and try to learn anything from them for sure basically um if you're in a city that has studios, like I would say it's a great help to work with an engineer who has a lot more experience. You're always going to learn a lot that way. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. Were you going to add something? No, keep going. I'll, I'll ask it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> um, 
once you kind of are in that phase, keep a portfolio either written out in like a Google Doc or like a CV of some sort. Uh, a website is great, like which is why I yeah. have my website is to keep everything all in one place. It's presented in a very professional manner. Um, there's also no fluff. There's no, there's no, I will make your record sound so good. I will, <laughs> I will do whatever. Just give people the facts. Uh, here's what I've worked on. Here's how many plays it has. Here's how many artists I've worked on. Here's the artists and the songs that I've worked on. Here's what I did. Here's my studio. Yeah. That's it. Here's how much it costs. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, the more straight up you are with people, mm -hmm. the more they will trust you as well. Um, oh, sorry. You, what, no, you I, was, I was just going to say that like, I feel like you can get in over your head. Like, of course, yeah. if you, uh, you know, take on as much work as you can. But from my experience is, and I'm curious what you think of this is like revisions. You know, if the client <laughs> isn't getting what they want in the song from you, how do you handle that? Yeah. Because part of that is a reflection of maybe it could be a reflection of skill set. It could just be that you're not seeing eye to eye. What do you do yeah. in a circumstance like that? And how many revisions do you give? So I am usually pretty lucky with. At least, I think I'm very middle of the road on how many revisions people usually need, depending on the project. So what I do, uh, when I take on a new mixing and mastering client or project, um, I will ask for, like, what are some reference tracks? Of course, like, what do you, who do you want to sound like? What do you think this record should sound like? Um... And so I take that and usually run with that for the first, you know, version that I get worked up. Um, I'll get the first mix sent up. Um, and if that's a master, if it's starting from the mastering phase, I will listen to their mix and give very, very detailed feedback on what I need changed to make the mastering easier. Um, so for example, if someone's like, what can I do to make this sound better? I will say, okay, yeah, um, bring the kick down two decibels, bring the vocal down one decibel, bring the hi-hats up 1.5 decibels, whatever else, send that back. They send me a new mix, whatever else. Um, and then the kind of like the opposite thing happens in a mixing job where I send them my version one and they say, uh, less this, less this. Um, the balance is great with the kick and the bass. Uh, less hi-hats, the high end is too aggressive, whatever else. I'll take that feedback, incorporate it into the mix. Usually it takes one or two to get it nailed down. Um, and then I move on to mastering with them, which goes much the same way, which is I compare to their reference, see how loud things are, see how to get it sounding as close as possible, and then maybe do like one or two re revisions there. Um, and then usually they're happy with it. I send the, you know, MP3 and wave and we are on to the next or um, just, uh, yeah, just done <laughs> with for that sure. project, I guess. No, um, yeah, that's, thank you for just that walkthrough because I feel like that is helpful for people who wouldn't even, you know, really know like, oh yeah, dude, I'll just do like a hundred revisions and just be on the hook for, like, do you, no, yeah. you know, that's tough. Also, I think, um, mm -hmm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say if people are asking for that many revisions, there's, so in, in my mind also, I have an idea of how much I am worth per hour. So per hour that I spend on a mix, sure. I say, okay, I should be making around $30 for this hour of work. Um, so for a full mixing and mastering job, I end up spending, you know, six hours, seven hours on a, on a track, you know, um, which I think is a, is a good amount of time. I think it's yeah. a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so that, that kind of helps guide my decision making as well when it comes to what I spend time on in that six or seven hours. If there's, if the record starts at like, let's say it's like a D, like let's say it's, you know, objectively in your the head, mix is a not D. good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say the mix is, maybe by someone who's pretty inexperienced, but they want your help to, you know, 
mix or master or whatever else, um, which is great. Like I'm always down to help with those projects. But as an engineer, you cannot be dead set on getting that song to an A plus because it will not happen. It will never happen. Mm -hmm. um, you need to focus on adding your value to the project, which might only get it to like a B plus. It might get it to a B. It might get it to an A minus. Um, but if you spend the time to get it to an A plus, you are kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Like you're, you're doing like on the business side of things, you are possibly doing too much when you could be working on other projects, like, and moving on to the next project. Yeah. Essentially. And also like the amount of time you spend on it might not be worth it to this person. So wait that long, you know? Um, I think most people are very happy if you send something back and it is like two letter grades better, mm -hmm. which also means if someone sends you like a B, which is probably what happened, like, I mean, even like the Prism stuff was like an A in my eyes. I'm like, damn, this sounds really good. So my six or seven hours went into that finessing the absolute shit out of the fine details yeah. and making very artistic decisions, you know? Um, but I think that I added my value. I, I wasn't like wasting my time. I wasn't really spinning my wheels. Um, because at the end of the day, like it's not about like making every record sound perfect or else you're going to go crazy. Like you yeah. as an engineer are not going to have a nice time if that's what you're trying to do. Um, for sure just being realistic it's, like <laughs> um, I, I feel like and again if we're going to talk about like you know the person that doesn't and is trying to get into this and doesn't know anything it's like yeah you're also probably going to be dealing with a lot of people who are you know quote unquote amateurs as well and you probably yeah. just are going to have to like deal with some people that don't know what they're talking about like it sounds of like <laughs> at least a lot of the people that you work with like if you're if you're a producer at this point in the game like you know what eq is you know you know a lot about mixing and mastering but you yeah it's always good to get like a second set of hands ears on the project mm -hmm. so like i mean I, the thing i was just gonna add is that you know if you're new, you're probably going to deal with a lot of other people who are also new. So just like yeah. accept that it's might not be perfect. There might oh, be yeah. some growing pains. Absolutely. And like, um, it's this, this is like, yeah, I, you're right that like a lot of people, if you are just starting out, like you're not going to be operating at the same level as someone who's been doing it for 20 years. Of course. Like, um, and you can't expect to, like you can't expect to be an incredible engineer without training your ears a little bit without spending the time learning your tools. And I'm still like deep in the learning. I'm yeah. deep in the learning phase, like always. Um, For sure. But I think like as a mastering engineer, the more, well, or mixing, the more communication you have with people you're working with, the less likely it is that people are going to be like, you know, upset with your work or, or feel confused by what you're doing exactly. Like, mm -hmm. because I don't think mixing and mastering needs to be like some mysterious thing that happens in the studio. Cause everyone's like, oh, like mastering is some yeah, like dark no art or whatever. It, like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think like it shouldn't be scary to talk to a mastering engineer. I think that the best thing that a mastering engineer can do is lend you their hopefully more trained ear or like. Mm -hmm just thinking about more objective details rather than like the subjective parts of like production and mixing and whatever else. Like the mastering engineer is there to tell you, Hey, like this hi-hat might be too loud for the mix phase, but it's going to sound fine once it goes through the mastering chain, you know, like just preparing for that process is not something that everyone understands exactly. And the more that you're mastering, the more you'll understand what you need on the way in which is why it's good to get a mastering engineer's feedback just on your mix, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and then the same for like, you know, a mixing engineer, when people ask me and I'm mixing their record, they're like, oh, is there anything I could do differently? Um, just on the earlier stages, which is like production and writing and whatever else. I'm like, oh yeah, like my knowledge as a mixing engineer helps inform the production side. 
as well as it helps to inform like the mastering side of what I do. So it's great to have all these kind of sections of the job like intertwining a little bit, mm. which yeah. is kind of nice. I feel like I learned something about one part of the job by doing the other parts of the job as well. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And that just helps me feel more comfortable as all of those things, essentially. For sure. I so feel like... The more, <laughs> the more practice you get, the better. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and the more angles you can look at a song, let's say. Like, I felt like when I started DJing more, it taught me a lot about song structure that I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, when you're, yeah. when you're producing, <laughs> you're like so in it, not thinking about it, but... Yeah, I mean, definitely get a lot of angles. I also kind of wanted to ask you like that uh, desert island question. Like if you, as a mixer, and we could also do mastering too. Like, and I'll preface this by saying that a lot of people get sucked into having to buy all this <laughs> stuff. And a lot of times yeah. your DAW has a lot of stock stuff. That sounds that's true. pretty good if you know how to use it. But at the same time, there are certain tools out there that are just like fantastic. So I'm curious if you would be willing to share one plug-in mm. piece of gear that you think is like the best or like any, oh, anyone man. would benefit from. I think they're like, okay, so I, I've kind of got almost two answers for that because one would be the thing that lots of people know about but is just my favorite. And then the second would be like a plugin that not as many people know about, but I use in almost every session. Um, well, number one would be the Isotope Dynamic EQ. Um, and I know like Fab Filter EQ can do the same thing. So just any Dynamic EQ is so sick. Like, um, just it has the ability to function as an EQ and a compressor and an expander all combined into one you can accomplish a lot without having the downside of like, if you're using a multi-band plugin, there's going to be crossover distortion in between your bands. Mm. So uh, Dynamic EQ does away with any of those issues. Like there can still be a lot of weirdness, but like literally, I feel like I could probably master something using primarily Dynamic EQ and get away with it. Um but yeah, it's it's kind of like a jack of all trades. It can work as a DSer if you need that. It can work like just to increase punch of certain things um, without kind of disrupting the rest of the the frequencies, which is dope. Yeah, and it can um, do it like in time. So it's like, oh, we're gonna boost yeah. <laughs> this when the kick happens. So it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's it's a great tool. Um, I pretty much use. I mean, I definitely use it in every mix. Uh, most mastering jobs. Um, and the more you like understand compression, the more useful it can be, I would say. Um, but that's a great one. Would not uh, live without it. Um, the second one, more on the limiting side of things, is Standard Clip, uh, mm. which is a very cheap plugin. I think it's like 30 bucks, 25 bucks or something. And it's essentially a clipper that can operate at up to 128 times over sampling. Um, and <laughs> it can essentially, like, it can function as a hard clipper. It can do soft clipping. It can do kind of intelligent clipping um, or even just operate as like a two-to-one compressor, essentially. Mm. And if you need a really loud master, <laughs> you can put that basically at the end of your chain and just shave off two decibels at the end, like literally just be like, nope, and then just boost it two more <laughs> and be like, okay, cool. Now, this is how people get their shit at like minus four, right. like Noisia does somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, um, And especially if like that's what you're looking for, like if you're doing like a dubstep master or a bass music master and need that extra oomph a little bit, um, that's usually what I use. Um, I even use it on the way in my pre-master kind of typical setup. I have a DC filter just using Ableton's utility. And then I have a standard clip to clip any super high peaks that are like out of the ordinary before I even start mastering. Um, and how that helps is throughout my mastering chain, there's not going to be any super like irregular peaks mm. that screw up my compression or anything. 
Um, so sometimes like I know like it helps to get those out of the way because I know I'm going to end up limiting them in the end or compressing them in the end regardless. Um, for sure. I'm sure other people have different takes on that and maybe that's not a best practice, but like I haven't had a problem with it really. <laughs> so yeah. Um, overall it's a great plugin for like, you can use it in mixing as like a bus clipper or whatever. Use it on bass to like really like you can distort the hell out of things <laughs> yeah. without clipping your output of the uh, workstation mm. basically. Um, and I recently, I saw someone talking about on Twitter, like, oh, why don't you just clip the Ableton output? And there's technically nothing like necessarily wrong with that. But I find that if I'm clipping like the output of an actual program, then on SoundCloud, things fall apart because there's like all these inner sample peaks mm. that cause this weird aliasing type of effect in the high end. But with standard clip, you're essentially doing the same thing just within a plugin. So you can like prevent all those crazy peaks from screwing up the MP3 compression, but still get the sound that you're looking for, which is really what people want. Yeah. When they're clipping, like if you're clipping, you're not just clipping to like, Save dynamic range. You're usually clipping for the sound that of the clipping. fatness. Um, does it have? Yeah. <laughs> does it have true peak? Um, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, if you're talking like if you're running it at like time sixty four oversampling or one hundred twenty eight, like yeah, there's no way. Pretty much anything is gonna <laughs> get through there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would say, uh, but yeah, great plugin. It's useful for just control and for pushing stuff when you need it. You know, which as as a mastering engineer, sometimes people want that even if it's not the best thing for the record. Um, sometimes people are like, no, I just need this louder. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Let's just, just, just shave it off the top, you know? <laughs> cool. But yeah, that's my long answer. Word. No, that's awesome, man. I, I really <laughs> did want to get into like the mixing and mastering stuff with you. So I'm glad we actually went back on that. For sure. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. I love talking about it. I don't think I ever told you this, but I also, I went to school, uh, columbia for sound design and engineering so i oh hell yeah hey uh you know some of the stuff there was one thing you said that i was like i don't even know but fuck it i'm running with it <laughs> <laughs> but yeah man i appreciate all that sauce and those keys because you know at the end of the day yeah like you just you can get sucked into buying so much stuff i know i have oh, yeah yeah uh, you know i've bought tons of things i don't need or ever use so just uh get some things that you're going to use <laughs> like truck. speaking of this is I've got a side note for that real quick. Um, speaking of things that are left field to use, I've got a literal guitar pedal board over here that I use for outboard processing sometimes Love where it. I can run drums through that and just absolutely roast and distort the shit out of things sometimes. And I've had people ask me, they're like, yo, how do you get your drums to like sound like that because there's a, cl a couple clap and kick samples I use that are specifically run through that and I'm like oh yeah I just have this like ancient boss pedal board <laughs> that I run th run shit through and uh -huh. then like you know what it literally whatever works is fun you know Dude, it's a good yeah time. you gotta have that random piece of sauce that like you know whatever yeah. it is who cares like just find yeah. <laughs> find something like if it's a piece of gear that no one else has like that could be an Perfect. upper hand even if it's a piece of crap, exactly. essentially. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta have your sound, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure, dude. Well, uh, thank you so much for a little, little teaching action there. I, I know, <laughs> no worries, I know, I learned some stuff. I hope other people <laughs> did too. Um, Hell yeah. I wanna, I wanna wrap with a, uh, a question that is similar to one of the first questions I asked you, and I feel like you kind of already answered it, but. Uh, you know, we talked about what your first concert was, but what was your favorite concert? And also, because Ooh. you play shows, I also wanted to ask, what is the favorite show that you've DJ'd? Oh, so it's a two-part question. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one, honestly. Um, oh, man. Favorite show that I've been to. <sighs> like, obviously, Skrillex was amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, I, f I feel like, oh man. Okay. I might, I'll let me think on this for a second because yeah, yeah. I'm just recounting what I've been to over the past, you know, 
years. <laughs> yeah. Could be a friend oh, show. Shit. It could be a friend show. Yeah, it could be um, just something that was really special to you that you walked away from and was like, wow, I kind of need to move differently now. I would say the most truly like past past the Skrillex show, the most life changing kind of show for me um, was at so Dirty Bird Barbecue when they toured with that in in Chicago. Actually, huh. um, I was just getting into house music. I knew a little bit about it, and me and my sister went off to Chicago for the Dirty Bird Barbecue. Um, I was definitely like not 18 yet. I don't think, I think I was probably 17 or uh, maybe I was, I was probably, I was probably 18 actually. Um, and it was like Justin Martin, Jay Flip, Shiba San, uh, Claude Von Stroke and uh, someone, oh, Kill Frenzy. Um, and that was so sick to me. It was like, really intimate. All the DJs were just like right there. There was not much lighting going on, like no LED screens and just like killer music, killer sound system. I had never seen DJs like play house live before, I don't think. Um, and I was like, whoa, I didn't know any of these records. I like... It was just such a new experience for me. I was like, I loved it. I learned something, I feel like. And I didn't realize that DJs could be this good and this big playing stuff that was so out there and like not mainstream, essentially. Um, and that really kicked off my like drive to like just learn more about house music, learn more about how to play house. Because um, it, was, it was just such a cool time. I felt a lot of unity like with the crowd um, and just everyone was very into the whole dirty bird aesthetic, the, the like, you know, vibe that they give off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it was really cool. It, it was very inspiring to me. Everyone was really nice. It just seemed like a tight knit kind of community to be a part of. Um, and I, yeah, I, I would say that was, it's just one of my many favorite shows. Yeah. Favorite show that I've played. Who, um, Oh, I've, okay. This this is an easy one. Um, just the encouragement that I got from this was massive. Uh, so a couple years back, I got to play, or I was asked to open for Zomboy and Hero Bust at a big venue, Dude. like in Indianapolis, like a big, like two thousand cap, like warehouse venue, basically. Um, and immediately, I was like, I know who I want to ask. To, to play back to back on this show because I don't want to take this opportunity alone. And this was, let, let me actually see when this was because I know it's, it's on my website for sure. I just want to make sure I get the, the date right because it was a couple of years back. Um, at, it was a place called The Pavilion. Zomboy and Hero Bus 20, 2017. Um, and I was opening with CLB oh, and we went dude. back to back. Hell yeah. And that was when he was like really deep in the UK house, UK base type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were just, we had played back to back, I think once or twice before and just had a very good connection as DJs. Like I have so much fun playing with him. It's always like just a fucking blast. Yeah. Like one of my favorite people to play with ever. Um, and so I was like, Max, do you want to come play this show with me? Uh, and I like told the promoters, I'm like, hey, I'm going to have my friend come down from Chicago and we're going to just play this show together, basically. And so like we got a hotel, downtown Indy. We got like my friend who was doing photography to come through and shoot the show. And we like walked over to the venue um, and there was a line like across the fucking like street, oh, essentially. Damn. And we're like, oh my God. Like <laughs> I thought we were like, you know, opening to like a hundred people or whatever. Yeah. And so... For whatever reason, all these people showed up like right for the start of the concert, basically. And there was another DJ who was on before us. And then pretty much by the time we went on, the crowd was just like ready to go. Probably 1,800 people in there. Damn. And we just, 
were playing a bunch of our original stuff, just fucking rocked. We we played like this one edit that I have that like is a Walker and Royce track that speeds up into like a footwork record. And so we played this fucking really weird footwork record for all these kids and it went way off. Just like everyone was going super hard. And I was like, this is, this is what it's about. Like we're playing our own stuff. We're like, people are into it. I, I remember I had done like a remix of this record that was called like 21 by this guy, Sammy Bananas. And I just did this bootleg remix of it, literally exported it from Ableton earlier that day and then played it on this huge sound system. And it was like, I was like, well, that's a great test. <laughs> like it, it sounded good. So thank God. Um, but like that really, I think kicked a lot off for, for me and him. Like he's absolutely demolishing right now. Yeah. Like, um, but just like for our encouragement as up and coming, you know, DJs and producers at the time, we felt so good yeah. after that. We're like, we rocked this show, had a bunch of fun. We, I was able to bring another producer who I thought deserved a lot of credit, of course, like to that show. And it, it was just a great, it was a great time. It was a great experience. Um, and yeah, that, it, that it sounds... was like the start of something in Indianapolis for me anyway, you know, like just getting more recognition, basically. Dude, that sounds incredible. Yeah, it felt great. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, Wow. It was wow. really fun. Those were some good answers and like, yeah, that, <laughs> damn, man, I'm glad I was able to come yeah, through on that through for <laughs> sure. Um, word, dude. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. Like, well, thank you for having me, dude. Of course, we could do it again sometime. Maybe, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> you'll be in Chicago or I'll be in Indiana. We can link up in person. But That'd be so awesome. Sometimes these online ones aren't the best, but this one was this is a keeper for <laughs> sure. Hell um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that, dude. Yeah. Um, thank you for bestowing all your knowledge upon us. <laughs> um, I just wanted to give you the chance to you know, tell people where to find you, um, what you're doing, anything coming up for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, very active on Instagram. That's where you'll probably hear about, you know, DJing production stuff, new music mixes. Um, pretty much everything I have online for any social media is just sweater disco, all one word, all lowercase. Um, cool. Feel free to email me, uh, which you can find my email a couple different places if you're looking for, you know, mixing and mastering, uh, production tips, whatever else. I'm always down to answer questions, DMs, whatever. Um, as for what I've got coming up, a lot of Indianapolis stuff for sure. Like uh, this probably won't come out for like a couple weeks, just so you know. Oh sure. Um yeah, I mean I've got stuff in October. Uh, Camp Terror, which is figure like the dubstep DJ oh, yeah. his festival. Uh, he's throwing something two days with Indie Mojo down uh, near Bloomington, Indiana on October 21st, 22nd. So I'll be out there. Nice. Uh, and also another notable one is November 4th. I'm opening for Justin Martin at the Patron Saint in Indianapolis. So house heads roll through <laughs> if you're in the area. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. That sounds like a lot of fun. Cool, man. Well, you guys know where to go now. Yeah. Yo. <laughs> All right. I'll let you go, man. But dude, thank you again. This was so much fun. Yeah, thank you, dude. I appreciate that. I I'll talk to you later, man. I